You want to be creating a tap that you can turn on and off that is like a pipeline of clients. Business of Architecture UK, episode 90. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and today's episode is actually myself, and this is a um, recording that I did for a webinar a few weeks ago with Enoch on the BOA platform where I go into talking about the 10 most common mistakes that I've made myself and that many other architects make when running a practice. So sit back, relax and enjoy this episode. Hello and welcome to today's special presentation, the top 10 business mistakes most architects make in their firms and how to fix it. Joining me today is the host of the Business of Architecture UK podcast, Ryan Willard. So Ryan officially started the podcast uh, at the beginning of this year. And during that time, he has the opportunity, he has had the opportunity to interview uh, many of the UK's leading practices and during that time, and also through his own practice as an, a practicing architect over there in London, he's had the experience to see firsthand what firms that are successful are doing right and the ones that continually struggle or feel like they're always in the feast of famine cycle, what they are doing wrong. And so he summarized these into his top 10 business mistakes and how to fix them. So I want to welcome everyone again today and turn the mic over to you, Ryan. And by the way, if you stay on the line for the entire presentation, We'll send you a cheat seat sheet that has all of these things that Ryan talks about so you'll get the entire notes and uh, some other special resources. So Ryan Willard, welcome to the Business of Architecture. Thank you very much, Enoch. Absolute pleasure to be here and broadcasting to all the listeners here. Really exciting. So um, just a quick little thank you for that introduction. A little bit about myself. Um, I'm an architect. I'm the founder of the Thinking Hand Studio Architects in London. As Enoch said, I'm the host of the Business of Architecture UK, where I've interviewed numerous architects uh, around the UK about what works in running a practice. And tonight, I'm going to be discussing the 10 costly business mistakes that I've seen businesses, architects make again and again. I've made pretty much all of these mistakes myself, so I can speak intimately about them, and I know the pain that they can cause um, through not just having the right tools and the right education. And by learning these mistakes, what's really good about kind of putting them into a list like this, you'll be able to, you know, the listeners here will be able to identify whether they're making these mistakes themselves and how to avoid them. And I'll be giving some actions that you can take this evening to actually start changing the direction of your business right away. And it doesn't matter what level you're at, whether you're a 20, 30, 40 man practice or you're just starting out. I think there's always, there's always another level to be uh, striving towards. And these mistakes can come in all sorts of different forms. So, and it's quite interesting really because, you know, 76% of all architects, particularly in the UK, practice in uh, practices the size of 10 or less. So it's quite critical really that this kind of education or where this kind of business information is freely available. So I advise take some notes on this webinar. I'm going to be, as we not said, we will be handing a uh, cheat sheet at the end to listen on. So the first mistake that I see many companies make is not having a company vision. So number one is no company vision. And many companies start from, you know, an inspiration or a creative spark. And if anyone's read The E-Myth by Michael E. Gerber, he talks about the most common reason for people starting a business or an employee starting a business is what he calls an entrepreneurial seizure, a moment where you're kind of in work for somebody else and you're thinking, I could do this better than you. Right? I don't need to be here any longer. I'm going to go do it by myself. I know that's how I started my, my own business. Um, people can end up starting their businesses from redundancy, can often be like a reaction. Um, you know, you don't want to go through the cycle of looking for more jobs. And other architects might bide their time to start their business and might end up moonlighting for as long as possible or waiting until they've got some big project before they actually leave their stable employment before the start. But there's no right way to start. However, without a vision that you consult regularly, and I really mean daily, weekly, monthly, 
that's alive and is constantly updated. Without that vision, this is a recipe for disaster. Um, and this, this has got to be a dream that's compelling. It's got to get you up in the morning. It's got to be impactful. Because when that disappears, and particularly when you've been running a practice for a little while and things, that vision becomes muted or you're not present to it anymore, um, we start tolerating mediocrity. Um, mistakes start happening. Um, it's, you know, fledging businesses, businesses are quite fragile and the statistics of success indicate the overwhelming majority really are doomed to fail. So that, that vision is really like a lifeboat and a compass that companies can really embed themselves in and it can be a generating force for everything else. Um, so when, when, you, when you have a real strong company vision, it's a very strong unifying force for you, for your clients. You will find that you will start attracting the right kind of clients. You know what you're about. You've taken the time to investigate about what you want from your business, what you want from your life, and it will start preventing this burnout and the fatigue that comes from dealing with the everyday um, processes of running a business. And so I think some of the, for some of the people I've spoken to over the last couple of years interviewing, I've got examples here from Peter Barber, who is a... Uh, architect here in the UK and I was so inspired by his vision and tenacity to this vision um, for his own practice where he's got a, a, a lot invested in the civic responsibility of an architect and really puts architecture as being a potential for social action at the heart of what it, he does in his practice and when you go onto his website that message is very clear all the writing he does is very clear um, and it's not diluted, and it's, you know, he's like, he's like a bulldog with that vision, and it's very enrolling to hear him speak, and it's very clear about what it is he does. Um, Roger Sturck Harbors in practice, uh, in partners, which is Richard Rogers' practice, they have a very, very clearly defined vision um, in their business. They actually call it the Constitution, and it's an extensive document, and Richard Rogers, again, really looking at the, the responsibility that architects have to society is very much put at the heart of this. Um, and he's got a number of quotes, a place for all people, the young and the old, the poor and the rich, all creeds and nationalities, um, a cross between New York's Times Square and London's British Museum. And this is a quote that he has plastered in one of his exhibitions and it was the opening paragraph to his submission for the Pompidou Center and it captures that vision of what he sees architecture as and another another guy I interviewed recently Harry Parr he had the vision of reinvigorating Victorian jelly and it was this kind of very um, bizarre vision almost but he was so passionate about it uh, and that communication, that passion, that tenacity became the driving force, the generating force of his entire company. So I want to give a little action points here to take away from this about a company vision. I really urge you to start writing what is your vision and project 10, 15 years into the future and ask yourself what kind of business do I want to have? What do I want my practice to look like? What kind of work do I want to be doing? What is my why? Why am I doing this? And it goes in as well, not only the vision for your business, but the, business, the vision for your lifestyle. And you want to make sure that your vision is aligned with your business values and the goals, the monetary goals that you might have as well. And start sharing this vision because this vision can be at the heart of all of your marketing, it can be heart of all of your communications, and it's got to be something that really excites you because when times get tough, going back into that vision and keeping it alive is a very, very powerful tool. So number two, working in the business and not on the business. So this is really the difference between a, being a technician versus an entrepreneur or a businessman. And the, when we're solely working 
in the business, we end up condemning ourselves to a lifetime of firefighting, working very hard on the wrong things, working hard on licking stamps and going to the post office and doing all the technical drawings and doing the bookkeeping and the accounts. And it's a fast track way to stress and burnout. And I mean, one of the biggest impacts of just purely focusing on working in the business is your family life will suffer. I've seen this so many times with um, architects who I've been speaking to and they're just working so hard, 17, 16 hours a day. Um, and it, it, will have a, it will have a really, really big impact on your family. I think it's in the E-Myth Entrepreneur where Michael Gerber says, all businesses are family businesses. And by solely working in the business, and I mean by being the technician, doing all the architect things, the drawings, um, you're never going to be able to systematize a business and have elements of your company which is automated. Um, so by designing your business, this is when you can start to systematize everything and you can start doing the things that you love and free up more time. It's a more fulfilling way to work. It's more effective. And when you've got effective systems in place for how you run your business, you can start to manage those systems as opposed to managing people. So I, I want to give the example of, of a well-systematized business. So working on the business is working on designing your architecture machine, essentially. How you get clients, how you um, convert sales, how you deliver projects, how you manage your finances. All these things require a design of your business, working on the business, a vision, a strategy, which is kind of like, you know, you want a bit of altitude, really. So rather than being right in the thick of the details, you're stepping back like an architect does, like the way that we look at plans in a building, you want to take that approach to your business to see it as an effective architecture machine. Um, I was going to say, looking at uh, McDonald's, now despite what you might think about their hamburgers and their impact on the environment, McDonald's have some very, very good business lessons to, that we can all look at and, and um, admire. Now, uh, McDonald's operates like a franchise. It's a highly systematized machine for delivering consistent hamburgers across the world. And they've got their systems manual down to such simplicity that you can have hormonal teenagers who really don't want to be there operating this business whilst you're able to step away from it and have this machine work. And we want to bring that kind of systems design into um, the way that we practice architecture. A really good book to read is The um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. And in that, he looks at the cash flow quadrant. And it's a, it's a four quadrant diagram. You've got, you've got employee, someone who's working a job, self-employed, which I would suggest that most architects are self-employed. Then on the other side of the quadrant, you've got business owner and investor. And the way that he determines the difference between a business owner and someone who is self-employed is that a business owner owns a business where he can walk away from it from a year and it's still turning profit, if not more. That's a, that really is a, is a very, very important thing to think about as how we want our architecture practices to be operating. Can you leave your business alone for a year and it still make money? So the first thing to do as a quick little exercise in um, looking at the systems for your business, you want to have just sort of start segmenting them up. Look at brand, marketing, sales, delivery of projects, management and leadership. Those are some good starting titles. And what I would do is pick one of those areas and start breaking it down into sub areas. So you could take the area of marketing could start breaking it down into advertising, social media, what systems do you have for referrals, and then look at one or two areas over the next 90 days and really focusing on systematizing all of the processes that exist um, within that area. And something to really kind of immediately take action on is where are you hurting the most in your business? Where is the biggest pain point? And ask yourself the question, do I have any systems there? Do I have any simple systems that somebody can just walk into and pick up like an instruction manual 
and start executing. So, number three. Again, we're kind of sticking on the theme of systems and probably the, one of the most important systems for any business is lead generation and referrals. Um, most architects that I speak to get the majority of their work from referrals, but rarely have I ever heard of an architect who has a system, unless they've done one of Enoch's programs or some of the programs at the uh, Business of Architecture, do they actually have these system and systems in place? Um, and this causes quite a lot of problems. If you're just uh, waiting for referrals to happen, it's going to be hit and missed. You're going to encourage that cycle of feast and famine. It's very difficult to budget and plan. Um, you're going to end up attracting the wrong kind of clients. If you do start creating some systems for referrals and leads, this will really start to allow you to pump up your sales. And essentially, it's, you want to be creating a tap that you can turn on and off that is like a pipeline of clients. Um, Jay Abraham, who I really advise everyone to go and read everything you can that he's done. He's an absolute sort of genius marketeer. Describes businesses as being, all businesses are designed to bring in customers. Everything else is an expense. And I really, really like that quote because it's a very different way of thinking, particularly as an architect. Um, we are often so focused on the design that we don't realize that when we're running a business, our, the business's function is to bring in customers. And Jay Abraham goes in, he's worked with thousands and thousands of business, businesses and helped them grow literally billions of pounds worth of profits. And he says that he reckons that every business has between £10,000 to a million pounds of assets just lying there that these companies aren't seeing. They're sitting as untapped, basically. They're un intangible assets. They're assets such as the marketing, advertising, sales, the goodwill of existing customer-client relationships. Um, and these are just, just dormant resources within any company. So the first thing that you can do to start releasing some of this, you know, hidden, hidden assets, some of this hidden money in your business is list out who your best client, your best clients are. Who are the clients that are the most profitable and the most enjoyable that you work with? And then you can do something very simple, send them an email, maybe the project happened a while ago, or maybe they're an existing client, just thanking them for the work and the work that you've done together. And I often request a testimonial, which is a really great way to get them talking about how great you are and get it present for them of the, of, you know, the, the service that you've delivered. And then you can ask for a referral. It really can be a, as simple as that. And I, I often say something along the lines of, you know, I've really enjoyed working with you and I'm really keen to work with more people of your calibre. And I'm looking for five introductions to people in your network that you think might be able to benefit like you have from my services. Um, I even know other people, I've uh, worked with business mentors before, who will put asking for referrals up front in a contract as part of the payment. It'll be like, okay, so once, we've, once I've completed my services and you're, and you're happy, I will be asking that you have, you know, that you, that you give me three referrals to people who are in similar sorts of positions to you or who could be benefiting from my services in the same sort of way. Again, a very simple and powerful way of leveraging and utilizing those untapped resources dormant in your business. So have a go at that. And also another, another uh, good strategy that kind of goes a bit deeper into this is the Dirty 30 strategy, which I know Enoch and Richard talk about quite a lot. Number four, let me just grab a bit of water. Number four, again, still sticking with the th theme of systems. One systems that most architectural practices do not have, do not utilize, is financial systems. Now, this is kind of like driving in the dark a little bit and puts your company into a very vulnerable position. Um, you'll see very developed, successful companies will have systems for 
cash flow projections. They know their cash flow on a monthly, weekly, daily, even hourly um, cycles. Um, you know, I, architects often can be very averse to anything financial. We don't like to answer the question, how much my building cost? Um, we're not sure how much it costs to an acquire a client. We don't know how to price a job because we're not aware of, we don't have any financial systems that's monitoring how much resource we're putting into a job. Um, architects will often not know what their cash flow cycles are. I mean, I've been suffered this one before where I've kind of won a few jobs and actually it takes me you know, a month to deliver the work, then there's a 30 days invoice period and then the client is late for another 30 days and you're having to follow up that 60 days without, you know, from invoicing and maybe even 90 days since you've started the work where you're not getting paid. So that can cause a lot of problems if you haven't got systems in place to mitigate for that or you've you've planned for it. Um, and what ends up happening without financial systems in place, again, that feast or famine cycle can raise its head again. You end up not paying yourself. There's this blur I often see with architects between domestic and their personal finances getting blurred with their personal finances. They're not taking a salary out for themselves. I know I did that for a while, not paying myself, and it hurts. It really, really hurts, and it makes it very difficult to plan ahead. Um, and even not collecting invoices not having a system for knowing what invoices have been sent out, and if there are delays in invoices, what systems do you have in place to be retrieving them? You'll notice if you ever go to a bank or uh, a large corporate company, as soon as there's a, a missed payment, you'll know about it very, very quickly. As architects or small business people, we don't act like that. And it causes, it causes problems. So really committing to learning about finances and money systems this will allow better design more creativity and more freedom in your life and in your business um, and every architect i've interviewed who's been in business for a while has got some form of projections and forecasting and uh, i interviewed joe cohen joe cowan rather recently and she was one of the most articulate architects i've ever met um, around the subject of finance and she very quickly identified that the traditional model of an architecture business was incredibly vulnerable to the ebbs and flows of the economy. And simply selling her time for money as the only source of income offered a very limited scope of what could be achieved. And it's not utilizing it in the right way. She's not able to leverage any money there. And she went out and actually started creating deals where she was identifying with her clients, her developer clients, where their sort of most pain points were. And during the planning process, often developers are not that liquid in terms of capital um, because there's nothing, there's nothing certain yet about a project. So she was able to devise a system where she could cash flow not getting paid through the uh, planning process and would either get paid on completion of planning or on completion of the project and would often exchange uh, a regular payment in terms of some final equity for a project, which then ends up setting up a, you know, should be able to get a residual income coming off these developments over a long period of time, which again, sets up a very stable company. So what I would advise people to do is to really audit your business. When did you last look at your profit and loss statements? what financial systems do you have in place and also who can you ask assistance from having a great accountant is invaluable and also i've worked with a business mentor a lot who's really helped me develop financial systems to help my company get stabilized and also just education about money because there's so much false information and our schools and society have a very different way of looking at money and finances. So reading about money, um, read, reading how you know, the money masters like Warren Buffett or Jeff Bezos, how do they make their money? How do they use money? Um, Robert Kiyosaki, again, another, another good example of just learning about financial systems and money systems. Number five, working alone. So, 
This is quite common, as I said earlier, about 76% of all architects in the UK um, work in a practice of 10 or more, and a substantial amount of that are people as sole practitioners. And in the UK, it's, it's very hard. I don't know the exact numbers. But when you're working alone, running a business is already very, very lonely. It can be very lonely, in, when, particularly when things are not, going, are not going well. And when you're working alone, you're going to be doing absolutely everything. You're going to be licking the stamps. You're going to be cleaning the bins. You're going to be prospecting, marketing, doing the planning drawings, posting the drawings, technical drawings. You'd have been the contracts, admin, accounting, everything. And if there's no form of delegation or outsourcing, and again, this is where those systems come into place because it helps you outsource and grow your business, this really is a recipe for disaster. Um, and again, we, we kind of inherit this from working as an employee in architectural practices where we have this mindset, I've got to focus on the design. The design is the most important thing. Uh, and actually, it's not the most highest, in terms of a business, it's not the highest value um, task that you could be doing. You often find the highest value tasks that you should be doing are marketing, sales, prospecting, developing business systems, things that are geared towards growing your company. Um, and by working alone, you're never going to be able to give yourself the time to be able to focus on those other activities. So... A really great book to read is The, uh, the Four-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss, where he talks at great length about outsourcing. And we live in a world now where there is an app for almost anything. And many tasks that you find yourself doing, um, things like bookkeeping, there are so many apps on Expenditure or Spensify where you can just take pictures of your um, expenses and it gets, you know, your books and your accounts are done automatically. Um, to hiring people in uh, lower wage economies. I mean, I've used um, virtual assistants in the Philippines. I've, outs I've outsourced very basic drawing work to India before, um, and you can get incredible turnarounds with this with this kind of um, uh, with these kinds of uh, companies. And it really frees up your time to start focusing on designing that business. Um, and, I, and I work with. Having interviewed a, with a lot of architects who have been in business for a long time, it's rare that I meet anyone who's just been doing it by themselves. Occasionally, I do meet someone who's been doing it 10, 15 years all, all by themselves. But generally, uh, if you want a, a practice that's got some oomph behind it, there's often two partners. And I think that could be a, a whole podcast in itself about what makes a great partnership. But I've heard investors, for example, at um, sort of angel investing events. And one of the things they look for in young startup companies when they're investing money is, is there just one of them or is there two of them? Uh, and if of, often if it's just one single person, an alarm bell might ring up in their minds thinking, well, if you can't, if you can't enroll anybody else into your business, that's already a little bit of a, a bit of a question mark for me. And also, when, you're, when you start building a team or you're working with others, it's not it's, it's not just adding one extra person, it's a multiplier. When there's two of you, it's like there's four of you. you know? When there's three of you, it's like there's nine of you, and so on, because new ideas start uh, getting made, things happen quicker, it's so much more fun as well. I think more than anything else, when there's more than one person, and you've got teams, and you're talking with people, it is just such a huge, valuable asset. So an, an advice for um, architects who are starting out by themselves, I've interviewed lots of great companies who, who kind of pull together as little collectives. Um, Collective Works here in the UK have got a nice system of um, kind of networking with other freelancing architects and kind of building this uh, scalable network of, of talent. People can kind of plug in, plug out, and working, like I have my office in a, in a WeWork space, and I think, again, those kinds of communities are really great where you can start um, stimu simulating having a team and working and collaborating with other smaller practices. Again, you start elevating very, very quickly. So that is a wrap. Thank you for listening.